The Shark Deck. I'm Johnny Mac, hanging out in the basement with the door closed, watching OnlyFans. What are you doing? Today is the Rosa Bert Kreischer. Your producer is Whitney Cummings. Your panelists include Trevor Wallace, Rachel Feinstein, Big J Okerson, Donnell Rawlings, Tony Hinchcliffe, Jim Norton, Tom Segura, Miranda Cosgrove, and Kesh. I'm looking at a trailer for it here. You can find the trailer on the laugh button. And my, it looks trashy. Maybe you should just watch the final four instead. You know who is cheering for Florida Atlantic? Carrot Top. Yes, Carrot Top Scott Thompson, a 1989 graduate of the College of Business. He majored in marketing. Wait, so Carrot Top and I have the same degrees? Carrot Top said, all these young kids, all these even younger kids that might want to aspire to play basketball or baseball or football or any sport or anything they dream of getting involved in, they can see what happens right in front of their eyes. So you have no idea what an inspiration, not only for the city of Boca Raton and the College of FAU, but for the country, because the country watches this tournament, the world watches this tournament. He also had nice things to say about Coach Dusty May, which, don't worry, my brain translated into Dusty Slay, which would be a good bit. But of Dusty May, the coach, he's the motivator. He's the one who keeps all the kids together, keeps them focused, keeps them believing in what they do believe. Johnny Mac, you're not going to keyword stuff Joe Rogan into the title again, are you, man? Cut it out. From Sportskedia, Joe Rogan's friendship with world-famous bow hunter Cameron Haynes was the inspiration behind Joe Rogan starting archery himself. Andrew Schultz was on Joe Rogan's podcast and decided he would try archery. Schultz initially struggled to keep the bow stable before miraculously firing off a perfect shot at the first time of asking, he attributed his success to Joe Rogan's instructions. He said, get yourself a good mentor if you want to learn how to shoot elk. Rogan said, you got it right in the effing vitals. That's an amazing thing. You should probably quit now. The Baltimore Banner wrote, for this week's column, I'm highlighting a few Baltimore area comics that have mostly gained followings from giving people consistent belly aching laughs through social media. And I was like, all right, I'd like to learn about Baltimore comedians. First up, Von T, V-O-N-T-E-E, West Baltimore native Vonti has been a constant source of locally informed laughter for close to a decade. Most of Vonti's funniest moments come from jokes about the workplace, such as trying to stay focused while in the middle of a breakup or being rewarded pizza parties for backbreaking work. Relationships, including men being overwhelmed by spending significant time with their children while mom's out with friends and the dynamics of the Baltimore D.C. relationship. Stavros Halkia seeing a lot of buzz on him. He grew up in Baltimore's Greek town. His superpower is his ability to make fun of people in the audience, taking simple prompts and turning them into mini routines. He lures people in with simple questions like, what do you do for a living? And if the answer seems to be a little too highbrow to be real, he hilariously interrogates them until the truth comes out. Smurf. S-M-I-R-F. Smurf's Instagram comedies for the hyper-local, more specifically, black millennial slash older Gen Z Baltimore natives. He makes fun of the Harvest Fair Market in Hamilton, the local Amazon warehouse, and many more local references. In one video, he lambastes the Wendy's on Hartford Road, saying, What is the point of having a drive through when I can't get my food when I drive through it? I gotta come in? The author adds, The renting hits home for anyone that has gone there. It's almost guaranteed you'll have to pull over and wait for your food. They really do take forever. I hope you enjoy the deep dive stuff that I mix in, especially on the weekends. I, I don't want everything to just be Joe Rogan, Jim Gaffigan every day. I, I like diving in on stuff. The Age has been recommending people you go see at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. One of them is Chinese-born comedian He Huang. I've talked about her before. Remember her routine about being an unmarried Chinese woman of a certain age? That one, it went viral. She became the target of nasty online comments. Wang is 32, now based in Sydney, and said, Those jokes have been tested again and again in different crowds in different countries, so I know the joke was working, but I didn't know it was going to be such a blow-up. It's insane how heavily censored and sensitive people are in China. Anything about China just makes them so triggered. People left some pretty extreme comments, but I think some of them were hired by the government. There's a job for that, attacking people who have a different view from the mainstream propaganda. Her new show, Bad Bitch, is about my life as an international student. A little bit about language differences, cultural differences, and family. I talk about how I figure out sexual liberation. I'm not sure people talk about that, but for Asians, it's a typical topic we talk about. She says in China, they don't talk about sex. There's no sex ed in Chinese schools. We just have biology class. The only penis I'd ever seen before I went outside of China was a cross-section penis in a biology textbook. Thanks for that information. He Huang, Bad Bitch at the Victoria Hotel, Acacia Room through April 23rd. All right, let's see what's at the festival on Sunday.
As discussed yesterday, a lot of these shows will repeat, so I will scroll down and see what catches my eye. Dice Paper Roll, D&D Live, Dice Paper Roll, and Friends at the Chinese Museum's Silk Room. There's some FAQs. What is it? Thank you. Dungeons and Dragons is a role-playing game where players are... We know that. What is a Dice Paper Roll? Dice Paper Roll has grown into a snorling, spitting, swearing behemoth of the D&D podcast scene. 150 plus episodes, thousands of downloads, and sold out live shows. Each show will be joined by a special guest comedian. Oh, wait. I see on Saturday, April 8th, the guest comedian is Nick Mason. That's probably the guy from a podcast called The Weekly Planet, which is one of my favorites. If you like pop culture and like Marvel movies and Star Wars and that stuff, Weekly Planet is a high recommend, one of my go-to podcasts. So uh, maybe we won't go see that on Sunday. We'll see it on Saturday, April 8th when Nick Mason is there. Joshua Jack's show is called The Big Spooky Murder Mystery. That's at Comedy Republic. Josh Jack has been murdered. Terrible news. He was so good at comedy and getting murdered sounds awful. But on the upside, four of his funniest friends are gathering to try and solve the murder live on stage. It's a brand new type of panel game show. Three comedians are innocent. One is not. Strap on your detective hats and join them as they investigate, interrogate, and indict each other in their efforts to catch the killer. That sounds like a good time. Tickets are 25 bucks. Divide that by two thirds for American dollars. Some being lazy math, 18 bucks or so. Ray O'Leary's show is called Everything Funny All the Time Always. That's at the Chinese Museum. There's even a little banner here with a picture of a flame and the words selling fast. And it says here, I can play clip. Would you like to hear the clip? Let's play the clip. My friend asked me if I wanted to wake up early and go see the sunrise, uh, if that was something that would interest me. Uh, And I said, that sounds like something that would interest a moth. (laughs) Yeah, because it's just so early in the morning. (laughs) You know, there's a reason that the only people awake to see the sunrise are Instagram influencers and meth addicts. And as I've been mentioning, there's like a hundred shows a night, the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. And I shared this on the Facebook group, Daily Comedy News Podcast group the other day. It's an article from Esquire magazine back in 2002. It is titled Johnny Carson, The Man Who Retired. The author Bill Zemi passed away recently, and I learned about the article from the Press Box podcast, who was talking about Bill's passing, and I'm a big Carson fan. Back in 2002, Bill wrote, There are nights, Johnny will tell you, that he finds himself back where he was, back where we had him before we could not have him anymore. Johnny will say, I still, believe it or not, have dreams in which I am late for The Tonight Show. It's a performer's nightmare, apparently. I've checked in with other people, and it occurs to them frequently, and it's frightening. Because I'm not prepared. It's showtime. I'm going on. I've got nothing to say. Jesus, I wake up in a sweat. It's now been 10 years since I've been done with the job, but I'll be back there. It was two thirds of my adult life, remember? And people at the show will be as real and fresh and current as ever in the dream. And all of a sudden, I'm having to go on. I'm not prepared. You revisit the whole thing. You think you're on the air and you're not ready. You hit the wall. I'll jump in. My recurring dream is the show that I used to produce at WOR Radio in the 1990s. I will have the recurring dream that I'm screening the phone calls for the show, and I'm back in Studio 3, and Admiral Al sitting on my right, and Dr. Joy Brown's across the glass, and no matter how hard I try, I cannot come up with a caller that's good enough to put on the air, and I will have this dream every three months or so. I haven't worked on that show in 25-plus years. It still pops out, so I feel you, Johnny Carson. The article then talks about all the Leno Letterman drama, and Johnny said, Can you believe all that awful stuff? It's just ridiculous. He laughed and was bemused by the shambles left in his wake. The author kidded him about the movie The Late Shift, in which Rich Little played Johnny Carson. Johnny rolled his eyes as only he can, thus implying volumes as only he could. (laughs) Carson said, I think I left at the right time. You've got to know when to get the hell off the stage, and the timing was right for me. The reason I really don't go back and do interviews is because I just let the work speak for itself. On his 4,530th night, his last one, he left the air and he climbed into the clouds. Per his instruction, a helicopter picked him up. Just minutes after he had tendered his on-camera resignation, this allowed him to avoid the media. Ed McMahon said, when Johnny finished, off he went. He grabbed his wife, Alex, walked right by me without a look. He was so intent on getting the hell out of there. Now, one of the things about Johnny is you have no memory of old, feeble Johnny Carson. He walked off and you never saw him again. He did two quick appearances on Letterman's show where I don't think he even spoke. 
And he did a thing to honor Bob Hope, which was his last monologue. But other than that, you didn't see Johnny. So you don't remember old, feeble Johnny. The man went out on top. And that's your comedy news for today. Follow the show for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow. All right, here's the pitch. Five stories. They're all good news. It's called Five Good News Stories. No negative news, just good news. Nice, easy way to start your day. Hopefully a smile. Hi, I'm Johnny Mack, host of Five Good News Stories. You get the premise? There's five stories and they're all good news. So the number five good news stories, five good news stories. Follow the show wherever you get your podcasts.